Joanna. Um, they're live streaming it. So it's probably on the YouTube channel now. So Jesse clicks on Yeah. We will get started here shortly, so if we could finish up at the coffee, the coffee shop and everybody make their way into the lecture area. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see all of you here. Thank you for coming. I want to welcome you to the 2022 Opperman Distinguished Alumni Lecture. The Opperman Lecture is funded through an endowed gift from the late Dwight D. Opperman, who attended Dakota Wesleyan in 1947 and 1948. Mr. Opperman earned a law degree from Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa. Drake also has an endowed Opperman lecture and the Opperman Scholars, which Dakota Wesleyan graduates have received. Opperman was CEO of West Publishing House in St. Paul, Minnesota, where under his leadership, the company moved into technology products with the creation of the West Law Legal Database. The Opperman Distinguished Alumni Lecture was created to expose current Dakota Wesleyan students to alumni who have found success in their professions. I'm pleased to introduce you to our 22 Opperman Distinguished Alumni Lecturer, Dr. Alice Johnson Butterfield. She has a fan club here. All right. Dr. Butterfield is a native of Mitchell and has achieved global success in her career. After graduating from DWU in 1985, she earned advanced degrees in social work and today is a professor at the University of Illinois in Chicago. She has served as a visiting professor to universities in Hungary and Ethiopia and was a Fulbright specialist in India. Dr. Butterfield was instrumental in establishing the first ever advanced social work degrees in Ethiopia. Last evening, Dr. Butterfield was honored as distinguished alumna from the Ron and Sheila Gates College of Business, Education, and Social Science. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Alice Butterfield. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased and honored to be here and to share with you the way in which my education at Dakota Wesleyan University launched and impacted my professional life. I graduated in the last bachelor's class of 1985 in social work. And that's really important as you look at my future. I want to focus on how my life of service and 
and how that was shaped by Dakota Wesleyan. My lecture won't be a traditional academic discourse, so students, uh, you can stay awake and not worry. <laughs> but rather, travel back to me, to my roots in South Dakota and DWU, and come with me to the world of international social work. Our journey will take us to Romania, Ethiopia, and India. You'll see themes of mentorship, sustainability, the power of ordinary people, and diversity will emerge. I came to DW after 13 years as a full-time wife and mother, as a family of five living on one income supplemented by mobile home rentals and a lot of sewing on my part, there was no extra money for education. When I rented a trailer to a Native American student who was coming to DWU, he told me that he had a Pell Grant and in a few days he would be able to cover the rent. That prompted me to go up to the college. I received a Pell Grant and three small scholarships which were really important. The Ada McKeel Bacon Scholarship, Lewis and Julie Erickson Scholarship, and Charles and Ethel Voess Scholarship, and these made it possible for me to enroll. By this time in my life, I had figured out I needed to get a university degree. With Ginger Wintemute, who was on the faculty at the time, and Ann Mitchell also, both of whom were my friends and leaders with me in a 4-H club. Also, my childhood friend Gail Dice, who is here, we develop, and Merrill Hatwin, a DW alum later, developed a program called Catholic Summer Camp that we took to three parishes. But when I asked for a small stipend just to expand and continue the program, the answer was no. And it was turned over to another person with a professional degree. Degree. I think sometimes when doors close, they're as important as when doors open. And that really prompted me to move forward. I also tried to adopt an Amerasian child from Korea, but I'd run into all the barriers imaginable. Interstate compacts, age restrictions, costs, and social workers who ended up asking me what an international home study was. I put that on the back burner and decided I would go to the college. Randy Sprung, who I, is my professor, and is still here a social worker, and Ginger Wintermute became my professors. I needed to find a field placement in Sioux Falls. I wrote to Catholic Charities. For a couple of years, I had written letters to Father Ben Zweber, a Mar Marinal missionary in Korea. Letter writing was the, the mode. And given all the barriers I had experienced in pursuing international adoption, he offered to help Catholic Charities get a contract with the Korean government to place Amerasian sibling groups and older waiting children in South Dakota. The DW faculty agreed with my sort of far out pilot project for my field placement. Not knowing where to start, I did what I had learned at Dakota Wesleyan as a columnist for the student paper. I think it was called the Freno Cosmian? Yeah. I wrote an article on Amerasian adoption for the Bishop's Bulletin, which came out to the Western Diocese, East, yeah, the Eastern Diocese of South Dakota. And on the Monday morning after the newspaper came out, 22 families called Catholic Charities with an interest in adoption. By spring break in 1985, I was supposed to go to Korea to help obtain a contract. The results of my DW field placement eventually bought, brought 11 children to South Dakota for adoption. As part of that, I was supposed to bring a sibling group of three Amerasian children back to my family for foster care with a view to adopt. Eventually, Adam, Michael, and Leah became a permanent part of our family, and I now have seven grandchildren from these children including one grandchild now, who's also my adopted son, Austin Butterfield Johnson, who is here. At this point, I have to say, Dr. Michael Farney most influenced my life while I was at DWU. I never took a class from him. I met him at the Catholic Mass, and he took an interest in my life. 
When I shared the proposed events, Dr. Farney told me to let him know if I needed anything. And I've always reflected how many times we might say that, but Dr. Farney meant it. When I reached the point that everything was in order, except the $1,200 I needed to pay for airfare for the children, Dr. Farney asked me to meet. He looked at his wife, Linda, and said, I don't think that will be a problem. Then he wrote me a check for $1,200 to cover the airfare. I calculated this amount today, and it would be approximately $3,300. Dr. Farney's involvement of life, as you'll see in the rest of my story, made a huge difference, not only in our family, but in my professional life. I never forgot what real mentoring means, and I've tried to model his behavior with students throughout my teaching career. Now I had six children at home. <laughs> we kind of looked like the Clampets going to town. <laughs> but Diane Graper was a non-traditional student counselor here, and she advised me to go directly on to graduate school. She said that with an undergraduate degree, I'd have the best job opportunity of my life. But anything that I took would be a side road. And quote, when a person gets on a side road, it's hard to get back on the main road, end quote. I think you understand that in South Dakota. <laughs> when Randy Sprung, with Randy Sprung then, she organized a graduate fair in Sioux Falls, South to, uh, to take us on a bus to a graduate fair in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. There I met a recruiter from Washington University who invited me to go there and apply for the master's program. I mentioned somehow that I wanted to teach, having coffee with uh, the, the, the faculty person, and she advised me then to apply for the joint MSW PhD program. Eventually, based on the success of my field placement at Dakota Wesleyan, I was awarded a full tuition scholarship to the joint MSW PhD program. My MSW focused on new program development, and I wrote a song called My Mentor Song that shares my gratefulness to those who mentored me at Dakota Wesleyan and Washington University. I'm just going to read some of the verses. Carol, you asked me to come down to St. Louis town for an interview. Helen, you said, at my age, perhaps a PhD, MSW. But David, what did you see in me? Dressed in my blue denim suit, I spoke of teaching and research and program development that I never knew. Bill, you stopped me in the hall and asked me if I cared to work with the homeless. Larry, Jack, and Susan, you were there apprenticing my practice. But Michael, what did you see in me when I wrote just like they spoke where I was born? I thought of theories and research and program development that I hardly knew. So now the circle has expanded to a higher plane than where I first began, one person giving to another in the family of woman and man, giving as friends and as mentors, giving of our academic life, giving as a mother to children, giving back life to life. My first professional job then in 1990 was an assistant professor in Cleveland at Case Western University. Here I can truly say the personal for me is professional. I was selected to go to Romania when a faculty person with expertise in child welfare declined. It was my personal life, the adoption of the three children from Korea that qualified me. I put that in quotes. Romania, as a former Soviet bloc country, had experienced 30 years of totalitarian regime. Perhaps some of you remember the inhumane condition shown on television on 2020 of people with disabilities in Romanian institutions. I went to Romania many times over the next 10 years to give you a picture of the situation there, here are some verses from a song I wrote, The Land They Call Romania. We took a trip to another world, to a land they call Romania. Why did we go there, and what did we see? And what does it mean for you and me? Organizing was the plan to crush the human spirit with an economic stand. 
Heaven knows who you can trust. Pay attention, the securitate might be us. Intellectuals hiding away, writing secret manuscripts they hope to publish someday. Typewriters licensed by the state. Think freely and for sure you won't be great. People with disabilities waiting for their human rights and basic charity. But it's okay, the nurses said. They're only animals in dirty beds. Heart attack, emergency. They're not productive, so forget the elderly. How old is he, the doctor asks, and then the ambulance turns back. So if child welfare's your game, there's 100,000 children there no family will claim, locked behind the iron bars while the iron curtain hasn't risen far. And the professor said to me, a few books in our specialty is more than we could dream. We need management and skills, home-based services, because institutions kill. And what do social workers do? Do you think America could spare us one or two? So what did we do? With the grant from World Vision, our team helped start social work education at five universities in Romania. We sponsored short-term programs there as there were no trained social work educators in the country. I led student groups to work in an institution for the irrecuperables, as they mistakenly called them in Herlo, Romania. There was no return home from this home hospital for people ages three to 92 with various conditions, including motor spastic, crossed eyes, stroke, deafness, Down syndrome, and others with serious developmental delays just from being institutionalized. Here we focused on the strengths of the people instead of the problems or the disabilities. How they formed what we called bonding groups, which were family-like relationships in which one person's disability was aided by another person's different disability. For example, Ludmilla was a stroke victim, a former Latin teacher, bonded with Violetta, her high-functioning Down syndrome daughter, who helped her. And Rodika, a smart, wheelchair-bound girl, aided by her shy, developmentally delayed sister who pushed Rodiga all over that institution. Not every project is sustainable, and this was a very difficult fact I had to face after working in her low. It wasn't going to be possible to provide ongoing development to help the people in that institution. Nonetheless, there are other effects that give long-term meaning to an international experience for taking for students abroad. For example, my daughter Joanna, who is here, and it's her birthday today, <laughs> joined the Herlo team, and her experience forged a lifelong commitment as a social worker with vulnerable children and families, now as a vice president of a large child welfare agency in Ohio. How did Romania shape me? For 30 years, the nonprofit sector had been illegal. In interviewing past leaders of nonprofit organizations, I learned of true religious diversity. During the World War II Holocaust, Christians hid their Jewish neighbors. After World War II, the Jewish community centers were the only nonprofits allowed to operate, and they provided food and medicines for their Christian neighbors. Romania also energized my interest in new program development. After 1989, it was possible to start nonprofit organizations, and these efforts flourished around the kitchen tables of ordinary people. I witnessed Violetta Stan, a pediatrician, her students, a couple of neighbors, an opera singer friend, and a colleague start the house with open windows to serve as a developmental care center and early child intervention program. I witnessed Lila Anu, a woman who had kept her disabled daughter out of institutions during the Ceausescu period, develop a best practice for supported employment and independent living for persons with intellectual disabilities. 
You can only imagine this in the context where everyone in Ethiopia for about 30, or Romania for about 30 years was institutionalized for anything that did not make them seem normal. We did not, they did not wait as we do in the USA so often for a grant to begin work. They started a project, volunteer driven and at a small scale, but grants and funds followed. I came back from Romania and developed a social work course in social entrepreneurship, one of the first. This experience in Romania really brought me back to my roots in South Dakota, where I witnessed growing up new churches being developed like Holy Spirit and the rummage sale and my dad, Wilfred Kessler, starting the sausage supper that I think is still going on today. <laughs> okay, I saw new schools, community organizations, 4-H clubs, and extended families start parish fundraisers, build new schools, organize volunteer-driven efforts. And not without a grant, but just calling people together that care enough to act around that kitchen table. In 2000, I was recruited to join the faculty at Jane Addams College of Social Work at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Again, my personal situation of adopting children from Korea, thank you, Dr. Farney, opened the door for me to go to Ethiopia. Kay McChesney, a college who had adopted three children from Ethiopia in 1999, long before it was common, suggested to an Ethiopian doctor that he should take me, as she was very busy with her three children. It was the start of the HIV AIDS epidemic pandemic in Africa. My expertise was not in health or HIV AIDS, but I went to explore social work education. My research through journal articles and the literature had showed that Ethiopia had a vibrant bachelor's program through the 60s and 70s, and then the literature went silent. I kind of fell into this, really. You know, there were just something like doors open and you're there. Um, I feel so fortunate I met Professor Sayum Jaber Selassie, who had been trained as a social work professor in the U.S. and had gone back to Addis Ababa all during the Derg regime and been a professor. After the military regime fell in 2000, he put a place, a master's degree in social work in the strategic plan of the university. Very cognizant of the brain drain, Professor Sayum was intent on building Ethiopia's capacity. At our first planning meeting, he said, sustainability is built on the capacity of the faculty. I took it to heart that sustainability, not only in academic programs, but in anything we start, should be planned from the beginning. We set up a university to university partnership between Addis Ababa University and my university, and we called it Project Sweep, Social Work Education in Par Ethiopia Partnership. You know, you have to make an acronym that people can say. <laughs> to some, Sweep was just a web page, but it really was more than that. It was a vision and a mission. We staffed the program by reaching out to colleagues in our networks and we used block teaching. International faculty sandwiched teaching courses between semesters, used their summer vacation. Some were retired and went. Others used sabbaticals or Fulbright awards. We staffed that program for about five years till they had the capacity to teach themselves. Overall, the mantra for the MSW program was, as Dr. Abby Tassi, our volunteer dean at the time, stated, we will start the MSW program with or without money, with or without office space, with or without books or resident faculty. Again, that figuring out how to do things by just getting started. It was the first ever MSW program in Ethiopia since the bachelor's degree had ended 30 years before. We started the PhD program two, about four days after the first graduating class knowing that sustainability is built on the capacity of the faculty. At this point in 2020, at just at Addis Ababa University, there has been 1,492 graduates. 
a good portion of those are their own BSW uh, graduates that they started all without any partnership help later, 589 MSWs and 40 PhDs. Through doctoral education, social work now is spread to 13 universities through the country. This development is really possible because of policy. The government set an admission requirement that those who applied to their PhD, this PhD program had to already be employed as a lecturer in another university. The idea was that such persons would get a leave from their current university, go get their degree, and go back and teach. And the minute they got back to their former university, they were asked to start a social work program. <laughs> so that's how it spread. The projects that's dearest to my heart, I think, though, is my work with uh, people living in the urban slums called Gadam Safer in uh, Ethiopia. It's called the Gadam Safer Community Partnership. Based on student work in courses, some action research, and all those MSWs had to do thesis uh, research, so we had a lot of information and a lot of connection with urban slum communities, especially those near the university. In reaching out then to this community where we had relationships, we shared the guiding principles of asset-based community development, or ABCD. And these strategies are not top-down development, but they're really bottom-up that start really with what the community, what regular, ordinary people want, and then bridge outward. The Oak Foundation agreed to fund our project, which did not have any predefined outcomes. And for those of you that have ever written grants, they want to know how many people are going to come and how many training sessions you have, et cetera, et cetera. But we convinced them that we would improve child well-being in the community, and that we would do that through the people's own projects with our support. So the partnership did not bring pre-identified projects to the community for their acceptance and participation. Rather, university and community leaders would work with the residents to prioritize issues, understand, document, and organize the community's inherent strengths and cap capabilities, and develop methods of community organizing alongside the, the residents. It would implement short-term projects using participatory methods and work to build the partnership's organizational capacity again to sustain its long-term activities. The involvement of children in this effort was really unique. The Gadam Safer adults had included children as equal members with adults in their planning process. And this is because of the value in my work not only uh, in Ethiopia, but also India and Romania, how much uh, people value people place on the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. It's very different than here, where we look more as children to be protected and don't really push forward their rights. So they included them as equal members in their planning, and as the children were experiencing this, they came to the partnership leaders and wanted their own uh, ABCD uh, visioning process. In turn, this fueled the whole effort, which I thought it's really something not rocket science, but we all love our kids and we want the best for them, sometimes wanting more than they want, right? And it was true there. So what did the community want? The children wanted books, and this was echoed by their parents. We were able to partner with Books for Africa, and 40,000 books came to Gadam Sefer with two additional containers to the universities. The books had meaning, additional to the fact that it was a book, that which we call low-hanging fruit in development work. Communities need to see some early results in their efforts, to keep them involved, to give them hope, and for, to help ordinary participants believe that their time is worth uh, the effort. The books provided that. The most important outcome turned to be something we could have never have planned because at Dakota Wesley and I never did anything with theater. So it was a children's theater group. 
none of us had expertise in theater. So we found, when the children came and wanted a drama group, we, in ABCD, look at what's available in the community with strengths and capacities and the partnership brings from the outside to fill a gap. And there was a, a, a Pushkin Center outside the community that had drama training. We were able to fund drama training for eventually about 150 kids from the community. The training, however, only focused on theater, voice, stage movement, and everything else related to being on stage and uh, putting uh, a, a, a drama on. The children had already started writing their own plays and continued this. No one advised them to compose or perform their own plays on, on the issues that they wanted to present. But in a densely populated slum, the prevalence of child trafficking, drug addiction, child abuse, um, poverty, touched their lives and the lives of their neighbors. The play, their plays, I think they, eventually wrote about 30 plays, exposed gender discrimination, documented the lives of orphan street children, and revealed the exploitation of children for begging, for sexual uh, efforts, and labor. In April 2010, to fast forward, the drama group competed with 13 other groups in a competition on culture and democracy and for development, and the Gadam Safer took Troop took first place in Addis Ababa with the performance of their original plays. This taught me that really clients know more, as we clients know more than we as professionals know about the social problems affecting their lives. And our programs need to give them voice and the space to develop their own projects. My current experience in India is in India. Much like the origin of Dakota Westland, Assam Don Bosco University was built from the ground up in a rural area underserved by higher education. The area of India, I think when I used to think about India, I thought about the main triangle of India, uh, which they called the mainland but there's an extended part going east of seven states that are very diverse. And uh, that area is underserved in terms of higher education. And the students there represent seven regional states, including Hindu, Muslim, Catholic, Protestant, and animist religions. And I reflected when I came there, there's a big rock on the way into this brand new university from the ground up where a Catholic priest, Father Stephen Mabley, and some of his colleagues sat in the middle of this jungle area and envisioned starting a university there. And I thought about Dakota Wesleyan some 132 years ago or so. The pioneers came and sat here, I imagine, and decided to build this institution. My work there as a Fulbright specialist is really centered on helping them verify what they're already doing and giving them some academic language and some uh, support around their creativity and their outreach to the local villages. I'm helping them formulate some projects using asset-based community development and based on my experience with children in Ethiopia. I'm working with faculty to help them publish their innovative methods because there's so much going on at the practice level and it takes a long time for the practice to get to academia so we can teach it. If we're not really involved in the community, we're out of step with the innovation going on. So I've been committed to try to help practitioners get their work published so it can eventually filter into the readings for higher education. Well, in closing, framed on my office wall is the Bishop James, A. James Armstrong Peace and Justice Award that I received from DW in 1985. My professional journey has brought me to the place where I see diversity as a core value, an essential component of peace and justice. Without acceptance of all kinds of diversity, 
there can be no peace and no justice. I want to end my presentation with a song that I wrote, the diversity song that shares my personal reflection of growing up in South Dakota and wondering why I learned to love diversity. So I think they're going to pass out some copies of the song and I hope that you'll join me as we go along in the verses. You know, that's kind of the 60s and 70s thing to have a, have a sing-along. Well, I grew up on, I always have trouble with this star, okay. <laughs> well, I grew up on the prairie where the land was strong and free. So I wondered how I learned to love diversity. Cause everybody was the same Religion was in style Till I stopped to think of what my grandma taught me When I was a little child She said life's made up of Tiny pieces A jigsaw puzzle A patchwork quilt an impressionistic painting the colors of the rainbow find a place you know is right keep your colors dark and light all together what a sight and don't let go oh and don't let go no and don't of the other and late at night I watched her as she sat to piece a quilt stitch by stitch and piece by piece the patterns that she built denim gingham calico and paisley from my shirt no piece was too small, nothing wasted at all. As I watched my grandma work, she said life's made up of tiny pieces, a jigsaw puzzle, a patchwork quilt, an impressionistic painting, the colors of the rainbow. Find a place you know is right. Keep your colors dark and light. All together, what a sight. And don't let go. Oh, and don't let go. Oh, and don't let go of one of the other. Well, the first thing I remember, I was sitting on her knee. And the thousand jigsaw pieces were staring back at me. Find the piece with the different colors. Keep the borders in a line. All the pieces will fit, and the picture we'll get will be beautiful in time. She said life's made up of tiny pieces, a jigsaw puzzle, a patchwork quilt, an impressionistic painting, the colors of the rainbow. Find
find a place you know is right Keep your colors dark and light All together, what a sight And don't let go Oh, and don't let go Oh, and don't let go of the other But the treasure I remember most Was hanging on her wall An impressionistic painting of the Dakota land in fall. Upon close inspection, rainbow colors brushed separately. But when we stepped away, I could hear her say, see the prairie bloom strong and free. She said, life's made up of tiny pieces, a big saw puzzle. A patchwork quilt, an impressionistic painting, the colors of the rainbow. Find a place you know is right, keep your colors dark and light. All together, what a sight, and don't let go. Oh, and don't let go. Oh, and don't let go of the other. Well, we're all like little pieces, different shapes and different size. Asians, blacks and redheads, brown and blue and hazel eyes. We come from near and far and we live differently. But the words in my head that my grandma said Help me love diversity She said life's made up of tiny pieces A jigsaw puzzle, a patchwork quilt An impressionistic painting The colors of the rainbow Find a place you know is right. Keep your colors dark and light. All together, what a sight. And don't let go. No, and don't let go. No, and don't let go of one another. Thank you so much. Wow, Alice Butterfield. We are so glad that you have joined us back at Dakota Wesleyan. I think it's safe to say that Alice has carried the pillar of service beyond South Dakota to all over the world and brought it back here to share with us today. I want to give you an opportunity. We have just a few minutes to ask Alice questions. What would you like to know about her and her experience maybe before Dakota Wesleyan, while she was here, or her life from beyond. And we're um, on Facebook Live, so we'll need to use the microphone. We have another microphone with Teresa Creasy as well. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. I'd like to know how she got all the brains in the family. <laughs> <laughs> OK, you have to say it into the microphone. I'm wondering how she got all the brains in the family. <laughs> if, if you don't know, that's her brother, right? <laughs> Alice, do you want to respond to that? We have different kinds of brains, Jean. You are the excellent plumber, builder my dad's business, Kessler Plumbing Up, grouse guide, elk guide, <laughs> hunter, sausage maker. I love my brother and his support for me all these years. Thank you, Alice. Alice Wonderful. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. A different kind of smart. Yeah, smart Alec. Okay. Okay. Dr. Mitchell. You spent a fair amount of your time overseas and probably in this country dealing with situations in highly conflicted areas. Could you say a little bit about 
how you handled that? How do you do? I mean, how did you do? Ethiopia and Romania are not nice, comfortable places to operate. Um, it was a lot better um, up until uh, some years ago, a few years back. But what I think what I learned is I had uh, a team. We always worked in partnership with local uh, professionals or academics. Um, one project in Romania, we had a, a, a Romanian faculty person or doctoral student partnered with a practitioner from the U.S. and a student from the U.S. in our team for interviewing. But in Romania, I really had a colleague that was a former student, and he was what I called a cultural guide. I'd go there, and Mulu would tell me, you can't go to the community now. If you go there, they'll think you just have more money. And I really took that, like, really learning from uh, the community and taking advice about what was the right thing to do and what you know, alternate plans if, if it wasn't a good thing to go and do what we planned to do. Um, I haven't been back to Ethiopia during the terrible times in the last few years. So I, working in partnership really with the local professors, universities, whatever the project was, was really important. Thank you. Other questions? As, as a mother, and I'm hearing that you had many children, we would like to know what, did you ever take the children with you overseas? Well, uh, my one daughter, Joanna, can stand up here, yes. She did, and I think that's one regret that I have. Um, it was just complicated. Um, I was working there, they were, you know, in school. Um, and it was hard to leave them. You know, there's always another side to these success stories, the, the difficulties that you face, the things that you weren't there for. Um, there was a sacrifice that my family paid for this. Um, I said last night, my life has always been some combination between Catholicism and United Methodism. <laughs> and in this period, I went to my Catholic priest, Father Dan Begin, and he said, Alice, you have to go, they'll be okay. You know, but it, there's the other side is there's always a, there, the stressors on the family. And why I brought so many of them here today was so they could hear like, okay, what did I really do over there? Was it worth it now for you? Okay, Dr. Kelly. You mentioned a time when people in communities were really coming together to do what uh, was needed in order to better well-being within those communities. What conditions do you think facilitate that or encourage people to act to fill a need without grant funding? Well, the, the, a lot of the teaching that I do now, I draw on the word of asset-based community development, and it says that how many people do you think you need to make change? And I ask my students that, and some say, well, you need 50, you need you need 100 or you need a mass amount, or maybe 25, but the, the literature shows us that you need about seven people who, and the quote is, care enough to act, right? Because we all care about many things. But what do we care enough about to act on? And that's the key. Um, I think today it's more difficult because social media, it has its very wonderful benefits, but it also consumes a whole lot of people's time in comparison, especially with young people, and parents are busy with everything. But I think it takes also a catalyst, a leader, someone that steps up and says, we can do this, let's do this, um, and, and bringing people together. And you don't need everybody. You're not gonna get everybody, but if you get those seven people who care enough to act, and then uh, that will, it'll, it'll feed, others will come. We've, we saw that with Ethiopia, like. You know, I think it was just something people wanted to do, but we had faculty from all over the world that stopped through Ethiopia on their way to somewhere else, on the way to Israel, and gave lectures and things like that, because they wanted also to be a part of something important, something new, something good. And I think that's one thing we have to present not so much on problems, but what can we do of something good? 
Yes, we have time for two more questions, maybe. Did you have a question? No. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for this last song. I think uh, there's many of us in this room that have asked ourselves the same question. Um, thank you. But what I wanted to ask was, where does the underpinning of your thinking around building on people's strengths, where do you think that comes from? Well, I like the capabilities approach, and Amartya Sen, the Nobel Prize winner, worked on that, but also uh, I think it's Professor Nussbaum at the University of Chicago, the capabilities approach, and it fits in with strength-based social work, where we try to look at the capacities and the strengths that people have, not just their problems. When we went to Gadam Sefer and we presented looking at this approach, that was one thing that drew the community to want to work with us because they said everybody else comes here to want to know about HIV AIDS and child abuse and trafficking. And you came to ask us what, what is good about our community and what do you want? And that was just such a different approach. And, and I think that resonates with all of us because, uh, and a lot of so social science research, as you students know and others, is a lot focused on problems and need-based. So that there are some academic theorists and scholars out there that are trying to push forward the idea of strengths-based interventions. All right, any other question? If not, I have a closing comment. L Alice, last night you shared a little bit of your first adventure into <laughs> activism, if you would call it that, uh -huh. um, about your Jesus bus. Yeah. So you want to share with the group in closing about your Jesus bus. She's a little bit of a hippie, I think, back from the day. Well, I started out at Presentation College with a two-year degree. I wanted to be a high school art teacher, um, even though when I got there, I mean, they didn't even have any courses in secondary education. But I really went there to figure out about whether I'd to be a nun, and as I shared last night, I was really uh, sort of obsessed with that idea whether uh, that was my calling in life or not. And uh, uh, when I went there and applied for their new program after Vatican II, they rejected me because they said I was gonna be a rebel. Uh, <laughs> But my friends went to, nuns went to bat for me and they accepted me and I spent one year not in vows but try to explore that and figure that really wasn't the path for me and remember sort of arguing with God that, uh, you know, the, the Catholic view is God is calling you and you're not answering and I'm like answering since second grade, right, and he's not calling. <laughs> So I transferred as a junior, and then I met my first husband, Bob Johnson, and he took me to a prison in, in Montana, and I met Axe Murder at 14 and others who were in a Yoke Fellow group and, um, where Christians were going in and visiting, and I gave my guitar to a young man, and I walked out of that prison and said, school is petty. And I think if I had a mentor at that point, social work would have been it, but I didn't know that. So we bought a bus and we <laughs> painted Jesus is coming soon on the, I think I've pretty tried to destroy all those old pictures, but. <laughs> and it said heaven on the top. It was a, a Greyhound bus. And we took off across Canada and visited the Native American reservations and took uh, books and shoes in their Bibles, I think. And then we ended up in Hawaii where we went to uh, witness on the islands. And my daughter Joanna, whose birthday is today, was born there. And they didn't let us go visit the leper colony with <laughs> a new baby. <laughs> <laughs> and we came back and then we, uh, Priscilla Irwin, that used to live here in Mitchell, we had contact with her and she was moved to Iowa. and organized a whole group of uh, people that, from the church that would gather clue, clothes and shoes uh, uh, for 
to Mexico, and I put in an order for three bathtubs based on our plumbing background, Gene. We know Dean, Dad planted flowers in them, so why can't we feed horses in one and make a bath house for women and one for men? And so they met us at the border, and we went into Mexico, and uh, my, my husband at the time don't even ask me how he talked customs into letting our caravan in. And then I ended back up fast forward we were living on faith and it was good, but at this point I had two kids and um, we ended back up eventually in Mitchell. And that's when I found Dakota Wesleyan being here. And I think so much about mentorship and how important it is in all ways from what Dr. Farney did personally for me, believing in me and Dr. Mitchell and Randy Sprung and other faculty later. Um, if I had known about social work, I probably would have found it earlier, so uh, at least I sort of reclaimed my wild and crazy days where my parents didn't know really what I was about. Um, so that's why I came to Dakota Wesleyan, because it was here and how important that's been in my life. I'm deeply grateful, and I thank you so much for this opportunity and for this award. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. From, a, from Jesus bus to <laughs> Ethiopia everywhere. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>